On your Tuesday episode of Locked On Raptors, that is what it looks like when an Achilles heel snaps. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, temporarily known for now, but not much longer as Locked On Canada Basketball. It is Tuesday, August the 6th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons. I've been waiting 24 years for the Canadian men's team to play a knockout game in the Olympics, and uh, Evan Fournier, we're sure to ruin that right quick. Thanks, Evan Fournier. We're going to get into that coming up, of course, a little bit later on. Uh, of course, you can find me over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors, and you can join us over in the Locked On Raptors Discord server. Sad state of affairs over there today. Not a lot of happy campers after that Canada loss to France at the Olympics, which we will get into today on the show. Of course, you can find the show for free wherever you get your podcast. Follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend. It's always appreciated when you support the show. However, you support the show on the audio side of things. You can find us on YouTube as well. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, support it by hitting that subscribe button and also the notification bell. So you get a push notification every single time the show goes live or premieres a wonderful thing so you never miss a second of that action and today's show is brought to you by friends over at game time down the game time app create an account use the code lock on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply all right on today's show as mentioned we're talking about canada losing to france in the men's quarterfinals in olympic basketball at paris 2024 uh france 82 Canada 73, a very disappointing end to what looked like a very promising tournament for Canada after going 3-0 in the group stage. And man, you lose to France in the Olympics when your team Canada. Can we call this the Robert Sacre Blues? Is this this is the, to describe the emotions I'm feeling right now? I'm bummed out. This was uh this was a tough one to take. I was very confident going in. We talked about it last week with Vivek about what a matchup with France should look like, the advantages that Canada should have. And look, I could have stomached Canada losing to Victor Wembanyama, going nuts, having himself an incredible performance. But no, Victor Wembanyama scores two baskets. He goes two of 10, and it is the Isaiah Cordonier show and the Evan Fournier show and the Matthias Lasore show and the Gershon Yabusele show. And Canada loses as a result of that. It's a, it's a tough pill to swallow for sure. And look, this was not a good game. We're going to get into the stuff that went wrong, the way Jamal Murray and Dylan Brooks kind of have to wear a lot of this loss, I think. We'll get into the roster and sort of the, the big reason why Canada lost this game being the big reason that we feared they would lose a game in this tournament at an inopportune time. That's the front court. There was some good. There was some bad. There was some hmm. We'll get into that coming up later on, too. But just sort of general overall thoughts in the game. Canada felt spooked early in this one and never was able to get it back. The France crowd was incredible. Credit to them. That was the advantage France had going into this game that maybe I underplayed, frankly, in pegging Canada as pretty clear favorites to win this game. Um, and look, Canada, I tweeted it very early on. Canada looked like the Raptors playing in a game one circa 2014 through 2018, just totally shook, totally out of their element, totally out of their routine of what was finding them success. And they paid for it. And look, yeah, the refereeing wasn't incredible. Sure. I don't really want to hear about refereeing, though, because, yeah, some stuff went against Canada, but some stuff went against France, too. And you're not owed calls and Canada did not play in a way in this game that was conducive to winning the foul battle. They don't play a super like, you know, the, look, if you go want to go to the rim a million, million times and get a bunch of free throws, you can do that. Shea Gildas Alexander is one of the best in the world at doing that, but they were afraid of the rim for long stretches of this game early on settling for really bad force threes, obviously worried about the deterrent that is Victor Wembanyama around the rim. Rudy Gobert barely even played in this game, and yet still, they were kind of afraid of going in among the trees and trying to score at the rim. When you do that, and you also play on defense, this sort of, we'll get into the stuff that I really didn't like about how they defended in this game, the switches they conceded. They just played a style of game that was conducive to losing the foul battle, and they lost the free throw battle significantly 
largely because they could not contain themselves in the second quarter in the penalty while France could. And there were reasons for that. It was not FIBA weirdness or a, a conspiracy against Canada. Canada played a crap game for long stretches of this one, and they got what they deserved when it came to the fouls and the whistles and all of that. Well, let's get into the big takeaway here, right? The reason Canada lost this game is the reason we feared they would lose at some point in this tournament. And that is the front court was just not good enough. The other reason was Jamal Murray. We'll get to Jamal Murray coming up too. But the front court in this game got absolutely exposed. And it wasn't by the guys who you thought it would have been. I mentioned Wembenyama, not a great offensive game. He was a great deterrent defensively. Had a few moments here and there where he looked awesome. He had five assists. He had three steals and a block. But overall, not uh, the sort of dominating Wemby sort of you know coming out party or anything like that. No, this was Gershon Yabusele. This was Matias Lasor being incredibly physical and just sort of overpowering and overmatching all the bigs Canada had to throw out there. And look, Canada does not have a ton of bigs. This was their problem, right? Kelly Olynyk not good enough in this tournament. Didn't get a ton of run today. Was not effective when he did play. And look, he, he I don't think the team was necessarily set up to be the type of team that Kelly Olynyk was going to thrive on. There's no sort of traditional big man that he could go and play with. This is a team that liked to play small because they could press their advantage of having tons of good guards and wings with skill. That made sense to me. But asking Kelly Olynyk to be your five ain't it. We know this. And if the Raptors go into this coming season hoping to play Kelly Olynyk at the five a bunch, they're going to get similar results. He's not a five on defense in the NBA anymore if he ever has been and this was not a team where he could really go and play the four on defense and have it be a way to sort of optimize Canada's lineups um Trey Lyles I thought was really disappointing I pegged him as one of the most important players for Canada coming into this tournament and he played less like a big and more like a wing for a lot of this tournament he just did not play like one of the bigger guys in the lineup and that's not totally on him that's not necessarily the type of player Trey Lyles is. He's not a traditional five in really any sense of the word, but that's what they needed him to be. And he really wasn't that. He didn't offer a ton of resistance defensively. He wasn't super effective on offense. And then Dwight Powell, I mean, bless Dwight Powell. He he tries, he gives it all. He's also like allergic to looking at the rim and really struggled in the rebounding department throughout this entire tournament. He was fine in this game. He had nine boards, four offensive boards. Uh, we'll get into one of the crazier stats of the game regarding rebounding coming up a little bit later on. But yeah, Dwight Powell just couldn't quite hang. And look, I thought Ken Birch, like I was sitting there thinking Ken Birch should be closing that game down the stretch because he was just kind of offering the best resistance at the rim. He was getting in there on putbacks like he was pretty effective in his sparing minutes. But when you're sitting there in the year of our Lord 2024 and thinking Ken Burt should be closing this high stakes elimination basketball game, you're not in the greatest position. And so we knew the bigs were the trouble. And I think we all kind of thought it could be a Wemby type or a Nikola Jokic down the line or a Mo Wagner uh, later in the tournament that would really give them trouble. But no, it was the sort of reserve bigs and role playing bigs that Canada just did not have physical answers for. Shout out Matias Lasor, man. That dude is unbelievably strong. He nailed his free throws in this game. Credit to him, 9 of 14 at the line. Canada couldn't keep from fouling him. And look, he's just stronger than all of the players Canada could throw at him. RJ Barrett, Andrew Nemhard, Shea Gildas-Alexander. Yeah, there were some moments where Lasor certainly should have been called for sort of two-hand shivers, pushing guys off, getting deep seals, things like that. But... For the most part, he was just someone Canada didn't have a defensive answer for, and they didn't do themselves any favors with the sort of one defensive issue. Like they did play a decent defensive game overall, but the thing that I thought I thought really kept hurting them defensively was they were just sort of conceding super easy switches of their guards onto Lesort and Yabu Sale. Lesort in particular, they were just sort of like okay you know they're running like sort of a soft screening action way far away from the rim okay Dwight Powell's got to switch onto the guard now and so Nemhard or Shea or Barrett has got to switch now over onto the sore and it just made no sense to me that they were doing that it was what cost them in the second quarter where they had all these sort of small dudes trying to guard Lasor and Yabu Sele as they just went to work in the post and they just couldn't contain them and yet yeah, maybe the fouls were ticky tack in spots but also they were in the bonus you got to be careful when you're in the bonus and not concede a bunch of free buckets to a team that basically won this game on the strength of the free throw differential in the second quarter. I think a lot of that was down to just sort of lazily conceding switches that didn't need to be switches. You could have just 
you know, had guys fight over the screen. This is your whole thing with Canada. Shea, Andrew Nemhart, uh, Lou Dort. These guys are incredible defensive players. Dylan Brooks as well, but he was guarding Lasort for long stretches just sort of as the primary. But when you have these guards who are just conceding these switches and your bigs are, you know, having to hang on the perimeter, taking them away from the basket, your lone sort of feigned rim protection threatened Dwight Powell 20 feet away from the rim while a guard is trying to size up a dude who's clearly just the strongest player on the floor. It's just not going to work for you. And I just did not love the way we saw this. We saw just like Lasore relocating entire humans just with his back down dribbles. We saw it with Barrett. We saw it with Nemhart. We saw it with Shea on down the list. It was just, I thought, a pretty uninspired bit of defensive game planning from Canada. And one of the reasons they lost this game, they also lost this game too, because the guard advantage that we all thought Canada had coming in was a little bit diminished because Isaiah Cordonier decided to go and have an out of body experience as the starting guard who uh, was just fantastic for France in this game, 20 points for him, four or five from downtown. I feel like every single shot he made, what made was a backbreaker as well. Uh, and the guard advantage was uh, just limited because as much as in Shea Gildas Alexander is incredible, they, they didn't get a ton of help around him and, they did not press that advantage the way they should have. Nimhard was kind of a non-factor offensively in this one. Didn't even attempt a shot. That's tough. Jamal Murray, we'll get to him coming up too. But the combination of the Achilles heel of the front court, which I, I don't know what the solution is other than hope Zach Eady can play next time and hope Olivier Rue is going to be ready to go in four years' time. Other than that, there wasn't like a clear guy they left at home who could have been the big to fill in and been the center on this team. Chris Boucher, maybe, but he's six foot eight and kind of spindly. Don't think he was holding up against Matthias Lasort either. And so it's a problem that sort of we'll get into a little bit later on, sort of makes it hard for me to fully evaluate Canada's performance in this tournament because I think they brought the best team they reasonably could have. But it did, it ended up being a roster that had a glaring weakness that got absolutely picked apart in this game against France. And then on top of that, what was supposed to be their biggest strength just did not come through. We're going to get into that. And Jamal Murray having to wear a big part of this one. Dylan Brooks, too. He defended well, but man, oh man, this was a rough one for Dylan Brooks in a lot of other areas. We're going to get to that coming up in just one second as we continue picking up the pieces after Canada's Olympic loss to France in the quarterfinals. No medals. What a bummer. More coming up. Today's show is brought to you by friends over at Game Time, the single best place to buy tickets, especially for Major League Baseball games, because Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of MLB, which makes taking, getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on Game Time actually go down closer to the, to, as the closer it gets to first pitch. It's a beautiful thing. And I am a recent baseball ticket purchaser two times over the weekend. I went down to Cleveland and Pittsburgh for a couple of baseball games with my wife on Saturday and Sunday. We bought our tickets on game time. We got great seats. They were affordable. It was a wonderful thing. And game time helped make it all happen. And we kept looking throughout the week as the games got closer. We didn't late wait till the last minute because you don't want to end up driving to Cleveland without actual tickets in hand. So we bought our tickets before we drove down, but we waited until the day before the game, got some great seats, scored those. Same thing for Pittsburgh. Got to see Paul Skeen's pitch. It was awesome. And game time, again, made it super easy. They also told me where I was going to be sitting and what I'd be seeing when I sat down. And there was not a word of a lie there. Knew exactly what I was going to be seeing when I sat down in my seats. And it was a wonderful thing. Uh, never been to those stadiums before. They're very nice. Progressive Field in PNC Park. And it was made all the better because I knew exactly what I was going to be getting and where I'd be sitting and what I would be seeing. Go check out Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time by downloading the Game Time app, creating an account, and using the code Locked in NBA for twenty bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Locked in NBA for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, back at it, picking up the pieces after Canada's loss to France in the Olympics in the quarterfinals. France moves on to take on Germany and the way Canada played today, even though they sort of flirted with a comeback in the second half, all I could think was, wow, they're going to get trucked by Germany, aren't they? Uh, Germany looks awesome. They beat great Greece pretty comfortably today. France, Germany should be fun. Serbia and U.S. will be the other matchup. I think I'm recording during the States game. I think it's going to be fine. Uh, they're going to make it on and we'll have a rematch of Serbia, USA from the group stage in which Serbia looked good for a half and then the States kind of blew them out of the water. But it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, Canada's not going to be part of the fun. It means basketball's over. We're not watching the rest of the Olympic tournament, right? That's how it works. Either way, 
getting into a couple of the other big reasons why Canada lost and the guard advantage just not being there. We talked about Shea. He was awesome. 27 points, got to the line 11 times, hit eight of them. A couple of kind of back-breaking misses in the fourth quarter, but I don't know how much you can blame the guy because he was exhausted from carrying the rest of the guard rotation on his back throughout this game. Um, five boards, four assists for him as well. Nine of 19 overall. Had a stretch in the second quarter where he scored 11 straight points. Or was this in the first quarter? Either way, he heated up really early on in the first half and uh, was doing Shea stuff. It was awesome. He's incredible. Having him play for Canada and having him around for whatever comes next in the international game, whether it's World Cups, whether it's Olympics in 2028, it's a wonderful thing having Shea Gildas-Alexander as part of your program. But it's a shame they couldn't get more out of their other very high-level guard, Jamal Murray, 3 of 13 in this game, 7 points, 5 boards. I thought actually like did some pretty good work on the glass in this one in a game where every rebound felt like a struggle. Um, you know, A tournament where every rebound kind of felt like a struggle. I thought Murray was helpful there, but overall, really tough stuff from Jamal Murray. And he's the kind of guy where one shot goes in and you're like, oh, okay, things are going to go from here. This is He picks this up. He had a nice step back early on in this game over Wemby, and I was like, oh, okay, th that's something. Maybe this is the game where Jamal Murray finds his footing, and then a little later on in the first half, he hit a corner three off a beautiful drive from Shea Gildas-Alexander. And then after that, it, uh, it kind of dried up. A and just bizarre shot selection, tough shot selection, the stuff that we know Jamal Murray does. And this is part of what makes him incredible is he can hit those shots, but he wasn't hitting them in this tournament. I think he ends up shooting nine of 31 overall in this tournament. Really tough stuff for who was supposed to be by far your second best player. Of course, the second best player in Canada, RJ Barrett, baby. Uh, we're very excited about this, but yeah, RJ, J Jamal Murray just wasn't it, man. A and I thought, at some point in this game down the stretch, he started to actively take things off the table for Canada. Um, it, it was it was rough. He had a few looks that were just like wide open, you know, all day. Jamal Murray hits that, you know, three above the break type things that he just sort of passed up, uh, you know, drove into traffic, broke a possession down, whatever. Uh, a few more instances of just not taking looks that were there for him. It, it was a, a really trying time for Jamal Murray in this game, in this tournament. And we talked about it going in with Oren Weisfeld. He pegged it as the biggest reason why Canada would disappoint. Orrin Weisfeld knows what he's talking about. We're going to have to get him back on the podcast soon to talk about the sort of overarching thoughts on this tournament for Canada, not just for the men, but for the women who went out in pretty unceremonious fashion, losing to Nigeria over the weekend. They're done as well. But with Murray, like it, it's just as simple as the second most talented player on the team had to be the second most talented player on the team in a tournament where Every team's stacked. Every team's good. Every team has cohesion and chemistry going for them, if not incredible high-end NBA talent. And Jamal Murray just couldn't help them sort of dig into those margins against France very well. This was supposed to be the advantage Canada had over every team in the field. They were supposed to be the team with the guard play. And in FIBA, the reason I felt so good about this Canadian team was that the guard play... Like in FIBA basketball, give me good guard play over good bigs all day. And in this game, they didn't get enough good guard play while the bigs were incredible for France and overcame their lack of guard play. And again, Cordonye having an incredible game made it so the guard play issue for them was less of a thing in this game. And it all came together. And so, yeah, I, I don't know what you do with it with Murray. It's obviously been a weird summer for him with the contract stuff with Denver. I wonder how the performance in this tournament muddies that. I hope it doesn't for his sake. I, I can't imagine it will. Denver can't afford to go not paying their best players, considering what's happened around their best players over the last couple summers. Um, but certainly, I, I don't know how you feel good about it if you're a Nuggets fan, even though, and we'll, we'll get into this with Kelly Olynyk too, I'm sure. But like, I, I really, really, really enforce not jumping to conclusions about FIBA performance and tying it to what it will mean in the NBA. We saw this last summer. Oh, Dennis Schroeder, MVP of the World Cup. Of course, he's like the perfect replacement for Fred Van Vliet as a starting point guard for the Raptors. No, it's not how it works. FIBA is an entirely different sport than what the NBA is playing, and it's a totally different game, and what happens in FIBA games does not at all to me portend what's happening in the nba in the season to come um sometimes coincidence you know guys perform well perform poorly and then the same thing happens in the nba i'm not drawing any conclusions about jamal murray i'm not saying he's cooked or anything like that for the denver nuggets after what we saw here with canada but certainly i mean 
it's uh it's troublesome murray figures to be playing on teams that are gonna go deep into the playoffs for years to come and it, the things can change obviously a lot can change over the course of four years but it's been a, a busy couple of years of basketball for jamal murray and i understand if he's worn down i wonder understand if he's not 100 percent. i thought canada should have just you know jordy fernandez should have just said hey like it's not working man we're gonna take you out for the the stretch run of this game because i think a, a sort of a replacement of andrew nemhard even though he wasn't doing much on offense in this game but like Nemhard and his three-point shooting and just sort of his off-ball play his defense I thought would have been maybe uh, the the right mix for that team as they were trying to make that push late over Murray kind of commandeering possessions and having it bogged down to hero ball it just wasn't working man and then you know Dylan Brooks I think has to wear a little bit of this one too you know the second half defense I think was great and he was a big part of what they did defensively to slow down France after a good first half for them but uh still Four fouls. He was constantly kind of just picking up the ticky tack stuff. Picked up a couple of those fouls, I think, in that second quarter where they just could not re re restrain themselves from fouling. And then goes one of nine from the field. And when you have a guy who's like the big trash talking pest guy who doesn't perform and live up to it on the big stage, it sucks. It's a bummer when the, when the sort of guy who talks a lot can't back it up. And, uh, you know, you see the way the French crowd responded and booed the hell out of him and how every crowd does that with him. Like, this is the downside of having a guy like that. I still like Dylan Brooks. I'd still be thrilled if the Raptors found a way to get Dylan Brooks on their basketball team somehow. Um, but I, I, he'd be right what they need, but was not what Canada needed in this game. And, you know, as much as R.J. Barrett had a really nice second half and um, hit a couple of big threes, did a lot to fill in the gaps beside Shea, they didn't get enough from anybody else. Lou Dort, great defensive effort, also fouled out, also went one of four from three. Brooks goes 0 of three from downtown. You can't go five of 21 in a FIBA game and expect to be successful. You just can't, especially when you're so dependent on your three point shot for stretches of this game because you just couldn't get to twos. And, um, you know, they did better of not settling for dumb threes in the second half. I'll give them that. And I think overall, I'll get to it in a sec, but the second half was very encouraging. There was a lot of good stuff in there, but. They just dug themselves such a hole with that first half performance. It was a disaster. It was a full-on disaster. And Dylan Brooks and his offense in particular are a big part of that as well. Um, just not enough, man. It's a bummer. It's, you know, we'll get into this too. But the the bar in international basketball is very high. And Canada did not come close to clearing it today. We're going to come back on the other side. We're going to round things out with the good, the bad, and the hmm from Canada's final game in Olympic basketball in any of the tournaments not so good stuff over the weekend losing in the bronze medal game to the u.s in the three-on-three -three tournament the women obviously not making it out of the group canada going out in the quarters not what you would have wanted from a canada basketball perspective we'll put a bow on things with the good the bad and the hmm coming up in just one sec today's show is brought to you by friends over at ebay motors passion drive and patience the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive ebay motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance superchargers roof racks exhaust kits led headlights and more whether you're into speed power or style ebay motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die you'll always find exactly what you're looking for and with ebay guaranteed fit your part your part is guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, wrapping it up here with the good, the bad, and the hmm from Canada's quarterfinal 82-73 loss to France to bow out of the Olympics before the medal rounds. It's a bummer. Um, there was some good. So, yeah, we'll get into the good, the bad, and them for the uninitiated. Uh, the, the, this is a segment I do at the end of every show after a Raptors game throughout the season where we talk about a thing I liked, a thing I didn't like, and a thing that's got me a wee bit intrigued about the most recent Toronto Raptors basketball game. We will apply the concept to this game for Canada as well. The good, I genuinely thought, the second half performance was pretty inspired. I, I thought they, they showed great fight. I thought their defense locked in. I thought the way Canada defended Wemby in this game was excellent. I thought they used the sort of size disadvantage to their favor, getting in down low, swiping balls away, um, just kind of making it difficult for Wemby to get to his pickups and things like that. That was great. I thought they did a really good job with that. 
I thought they slowed down Isaiah Cordonier in the second half a little bit better as well than they did in the first, where he was absolutely just like shooting flames out of his fingertips and uh, igniting the entire French crowd. You know, they did a good job of really rallying in this one. It sucks that Evan Fournier decided to go and like do Evan Fournier things for the first time. Evan Fournier things. No, that's like he's not good at basketball. He's stunk for years and he just decided to turn back the dial to like his Denver days. And it was uh, it was a bummer to see. <laughs> it's uh, man, I, I'm trying, supposed to be talking about the good and then I'm getting distracted by Evan Fournier. Um, yeah, this I, I, the fight was there, right? Somehow. Somehow Canada wins the offensive rebounding battle in this game, which I think sort of it, uh, sort of points towards the way that they really gave it all they had in the second half. Um, you know, overmatched size wise and physicality wise, but still were able to grab a ton of offensive boards. They also totally failed to grab any defensive boards in the really high stakes moments of this game, including late final couple minutes. Canada is I think down six at the time or seven. And they desperately need to stop in a bucket. And instead, they give up a couple offensive rebounds. And it ends up with an Evan Fournier heave from near half court. Uh, basically, the dagger that sucked. But overall, like you don't get smashed in the rebounding battle in this game. It was just 37 36. Again, they win the offensive rebounding battle. That was good. That was impressive. That was like what you want to see. But again, it's just a little too little too late. They dug themselves such a massive hole with the way they played in the first quarter and the first half overall not taking advantage when Victor Wembanyama went out with two nine minutes to play in the second quarter. Um, you, you want to talk about ref stuff? Like, yeah, Wemby had two fouls early, and Canada could not do a damn thing with it. So don't talk to me about ref stuff. Either way, the good was the second half performance and, and, the, and the push they gave. R.J. Barrett, Lou Dort, Shea Gildas-Alexander, leaving it all out there. You can't feel bad about them sort of packing it in and not trying. So there's that, I guess. The bad, look... This was a golden opportunity for Canada. This is a really good team they put together in a tournament that is the best, yes, the best field ever assembled for a men's international tournament. I think that's pretty clear, but it's only going to get better from here, and the bar is only going to get higher, and winning internationally is not going to get any easier for Canada. This was a golden shot for them. They avoided the States in the bracket. They had the France-Germany pathway to the final for a matchup with the States in the, in, in the gold medal game, potentially, and they squandered it, and that just speaks to the quality of international teams now. And, like, Wemby's not going anywhere. That French team is only going to add more players. They just drafted half the freaking first round out of France. They're going to get better. They're going to get more scary. Germany is, like, I, I mean, Dennis Schroeder's not going to be doing this forever, one would assume, but... You know, Franz Wagner is there. They have a, a, a youthful sort of star player to build things around going forward. They're going to be good. I mean, Australia, we saw them today push Serbia to the absolute brink. That's a, that's a good team. They have some young guys, Dyson Daniels, et cetera. Josh Giddy, I guess, apparently is good now, um, at least in FIBA. Again, don't apply FIBA performance to the NBA. Watch out, Bulls fans. But yeah, like it's just not going to get any easier, easier, any easier. It would be great if it got easier. I'd be all in on that. Bring me Zach Eady. But yeah, it, it's just, this is, this is international basketball now, right? It, you know, the whole sort of focus is on always, oh, can anyone take down the States? But those teams fighting to take down the States, they're all leveling up. This is kind of like the Warriors in 2016, 17, 18, where every team in the league that was a contender was eyes on the prize we got to beat that team the Cavs, the rockets like these teams were building themselves to go and take down the kings and this is what it's going to be on the international stage now it's just not going to get any easier this was a great opportunity and they might not get one this good again with this good a team with this health you had most of your best players healthy and they're ready to go it's tough man um it stinks <laughs> this was a great chance to go and medal in the olympics 24 years of waiting and Matthias Lasor and Gershon Yabusele uh, were the ones to stop all of the promise. And then the hmm for me, it's does this go down as a failure for Canada? I've seen that kind of tossed around a little bit. I don't know if I would. I think I got to chew on this one for maybe a day or two just to kind of really sink my teeth into it. They lost in the way everyone kind of thought they would lost in the the sort of respect of, OK, well, Jamal Murray's not 100 percent right and the front court's bad and they lost this way. I don't know if that like this is like when the Raptors kept on losing to LeBron James and like most people lost their minds. But I kind of always just felt like, 
okay, you lost to LeBron. Like, yeah, that, that's going to happen. That's how basketball works. The best player wins most of the time, and they lost. Yeah, it was embarrassing at times, but I don't know if this is some grand failure of the franchise or anything like that. I don't know if losing this game in the way we thought they would lose it means this is a gigantic failure of a tournament. They did go 3-0 in the group of death. We all were very excited about that. I, I think Canada basketball, you know, sort of editions of the past don't do that. This was an impressive run for three games, and it all came crashing down in the quarterfinals. But look, that's tournament basketball, man. Sometimes things go poorly in knockout games, and it's a disappointment. There's no doubt about that. It's a total disappointment. I'm very disappointed. Again, I get the Robert Sacre Blues. It sucks. It's a bummer. But I don't know if it's a failure of Canada basketball to have not made it past here. And again, when it comes to, it comes to like the team selection, I don't think they left anyone at home who was otherwise available to play who should have been on the team who would have made a massive difference they kind of put together the best team they could have right now zach Eady would have been awesome i i wish the grizzlies would have let that happen but it was always a long shot nba teams are going to prioritize their guys and their rookies and their their needs and i get that it sucks i i wish it wouldn't have been that way but it just is the way it is and so it's definitely a disappointment whether it's a failure i'm not totally sure because they did do a lot of what we wanted to see. And we saw a lot of really good things out of this Canada team, not just in this tournament, but in the lead up. Of course, they won the 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 the, the bronze medal in the World Cup last year, which I think has to classify as some sort of gigantic success, which helps balance out what happened here. Uh, it's a tough thing to sort out. And again, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it's just semantics. Maybe it's stuff that only people who windbag into microphones care about. But I don't know if this was a failure for Canada. I, I think we'll probably try to get Orrin Weisfeld on and kind of dig into this question a little bit more going forward. And if you think it was a failure, by all means, say so. It's fine, too. Either way, it's going to do it. We're going to leave it there. And uh, regrettably, we're going to be back to talking about the Toronto Raptors every day coming up very soon. Of course, we're down to three shows a week throughout the summer, but uh, we'll have some Raptor stuff this week. We'll probably do at least one more show on Canada basketball and sort of putting a bow on these Olympics, whether it's this week or next. But uh, for now, we will leave it there. And uh, man, sucks. It's uh, it's a big bummer. Shout out Cameron Rogers for making me feel a little bit better in the moments after Canada lost this game by winning gold in the hammer throw on the women's side. That's fun. That's cool. Rooting for all of the Canadian athletes and not watching any more basketball the rest of the way, I think is the way I'm going to approach this. Um, how are you going to cope? What's your cope method? Either way. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much, as always, for listening, for rocking with the show, for hanging out. We'll be back again probably on Wednesday, maybe Thursday. The summer schedule is a little bit more fluid than usual, maybe that I'd even like. But uh, keep an eye out. We'll be back, and we will continue talking about Canada basketball stuff and get into some more Raptors things as the season is drawing closer and closer, about a month and a half away now from media days and stuff. I think they're over in Spain now doing Spain stuff. That's cool. Either way. We'll talk to you again. Coming up very soon with another episode of Locked On Raptors. In the meantime, thanks for hanging. Hang, uh, support the show. Follow, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. I think that went in. All right. I'm better than Jamal Murray. Woohoo!